So I want to begin by talking about the history of fasting, right? The history of fasting. Where, where did this practice of fasting come from? When did it start? Most people today have this impression that all the practices that were taught by the Prophet Muhammad or that are in the Quran, that they all sort of were given to us in one fell swoop, as if uh, they were all given on this tray and they're all implemented at the same time, sort of without regard to history. Uh, and part of this idea, this, this impression, is the notion that the practices instituted by Prophet Muhammad were meant to always be there, right? That they should never change, that should, they should always remain the same. And, and part of the thinking is that Ramadan fasting is in the Quran, therefore it must always be done all times, all places. But let's talk about the history behind this. As we'll see, there's, there's actually a history uh, beyond, behind the practice of fasting in Ramadan. So if you go to the Quran, it's in chapter two where the verses about fasting are found. And there's a sequence about uh, uh, several verses. And the first two verses talk about fasting in this way, right? 2.183 and 2.184. Now notice, notice that uh, Ramadan is not even mentioned in these first two verses. It does talk about fasting as something that has been prescribed for the believers in the time of Muhammad, but uh, the notion of fasting for a certain number of days is there, and a whole set of, you could say, rules are, are mentioned, but Ramadan is not there yet in the first two verses. Now, based on various historical studies, fasting was a well-known practice in pre-Islamic Arabia, often as a penance, as a sort of a form of punishment, you could say. So for example, if someone was, you know, committed manslaughter, if somebody broke an oath, if someone missed a pilgrimage, one of the ways to atone for this wrongdoing was to fast for days, a month, or even two months. There is some evidence that the pre-Islamic Arabs uh, had a practice of fasting for 10 nights. We don't know much about it, but there are signs of that of that practice as well. Uh, and the idea of a holy month, right? So Ramadan is, is known as a holy month. Uh, but the idea of a holy month is also pre-Islamic. Uh, there are um, four uh, holy months that pre-Islamic uh, Arabs recognized. And the Quran actually recognizes those as well. Now, if we go to the Hadith literature, and this is a very widespread Hadith, Sunni sources especially, it is reported that when the Prophet Muhammad came to Medina, this is in the year 622, he found that the Jewish tribes of Medina, who were actually part of his community, the Jewish tribes fasted on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement in the Jewish faith, and it corresponds to the 10th day of the month of Mohoram. This is the day known as Ashura. So the Jews were fasting on Ashura or Yom Kippur. This is an ancient Jewish practice. And when the prophet Muhammad saw this, he actually said, and there's different versions of what he said, uh, but he basically said that he and his community were also close to Moses and that therefore they too will fast on Yom Kippur. So that's the first fasting practice. At this time, uh, there is no Ramadan fast. Even when the believers are in Mecca, so before Hijra, there's no practice of fasting mentioned in the Meccan surahs of the Quran. So the first fasting practice happens in the year about 622, maybe 623. And it's, it's ordered by Prophet Muhammad but it's ordered in direct response to the Jewish practice of fasting that's already happening in Medina. And there's, there's a debate whether the Yom Kippur fast for, for Muhammad's community was obligatory or optional, but the point is that fast was done. And it is uh, possible, it's quite possible, that when 
in two, the verse 2184, when it's talking about fast for a certain number of days, uh, again, Ramadan is not mentioned here. This here is talking about the Yom Kippur fast and possibly some of the uh, pre-Islamic days of fasting, right? That's what the certain number of days means. So this is all here uh, before there is a fast of the month of Ramadan. This is very, very important, this, this, this point, very, very important. Now, at the same time, it is also reported, and this we can, we're pretty certain that this is the case. It is also reported that uh, the Prophet Muhammad, when he came to Medina, where I guess, again, you have Jewish tribes, he ordered his followers to pray toward Jerusalem. So when they were in Mecca, the early Muslim community of Prophet Muhammad, they faced the Kaaba when they prayed, right? They, they turned toward the Kaaba as their Qibla. But then when they come to Medina, the prayer direction is changed to Jerusalem. Why? Because the Jewish tribes in Medina were also praying toward Jerusalem. So this is very interesting because this tells us that the early religious practice in the time of Prophet Muhammad was A, it was instituted by Prophet Muhammad, and B, it was instituted by Prophet Muhammad in response to context, right? Early religious practices were very much tailored and crafted by the Prophet in response to the historical and social context. Why did they fast on Yom Kippur? Why did they pray toward Jerusalem? It was obviously as uh, it was obviously um, directed towards developing a certain affinity with the Jews of Medina, possibly as a way to show these Jewish tribes that Muhammad is a true prophet uh, that was foretold in their scriptures, right? Or as a way to have harmonious uh, uh, relations with these Jewish tribes. So that's what you have. Now, within two years of Hijra, so now we're in, in 624, things have changed. There was actually political conflict with some of the Jewish tribes. I'm not going to go into the details, but there were wars fought between some Jewish tribes and Prophet Muhammad. One of these tribes actually betrayed the uh, Prophet Muhammad and allied with the Meccans. So there's a lot of conflict with the Jewish tribes. And what we see in the Quran itself are changes. The practice starts changing. What changes? Well, the first thing we have, and this is mentioned in the Quran, so you can you can look this up yourself in the Quran. The prayer direction changes from Jerusalem to the Mecca. So now they, they no longer pray toward Jerusalem like the Jews do. They pray toward Mecca. That changes in the Quran. Uh, I've noted the verses for you here. This is very, very important because if the prayer direction is allowed to simply change like that, it means that God does not actually reside in Jerusalem or Mecca, right? It's not like God decided to change his address all of a sudden. That's not why. The prayer direction changed. The Quran actually says the prayer direction changed that we might know who followed the messenger from him who turned on his heels. So actually, the change in religious practice at the time of the prophet is primarily instituted, firstly, to find out who the true believers are. Right? They wanted to find out, you know, the prophet, God and the prophet wanted to see who are those who, who are truly following him, right? Truly following the prophet. So that's one reason. And in fact, the Jewish tribes objected. The, the, the Jewish tribes would ask them, why, why don't you face Jerusalem anymore? And according to the Quran, the prophet answered, well, to God belongs the East and the West. So this idea that God is not really in a place. The prayer direction is not about sort of turning toward the direction where God resides. That's not what it's about. The other reason why this is important is because if you think about it, by facing toward Mecca, the prophet and his community are differentiating themselves from the Jews. 
they're forging a different identity, a different religious and cultural identity from the Jewish tribes by saying, we are now facing Mecca, you can continue facing Jerusalem. So religious practice is a reflection of religious and cultural identity. That's very important to note. It's after this Qibla change, shortly after, I don't know the exact timeline, but shortly after the change from Jerusalem to Mecca for the prayer direction, that's when the Ramadan fast is instituted. And it's instituted almost like a replacement of the Yom Kippur fasting that many in Prophet Muhammad's community were practicing up to that point. Again, what's the reason for this? The reason is very much related to the religious identity and the context. These religious practices, these changes that happen, again, these are changes during the time when the Quran is still being revealed, right? The Quran was not revealed all at once. The Quran was revealed over 23 years in, in many, many uh, piecemeal recitations. And one thing we know about the Quran, that although today it looks like a book, it's not really a book. Uh, it's a set of recitations, each of which we're talking about and responding to a different situation. So when the Quran institutes the Ramadan fast, and that's what happens in this verse, this is directly in response to what is going on on the ground in Medina in terms of the relationship between Prophet Muhammad's community and the Jewish tribes. And many scholars have recognized that changing the Qibla from Jerusalem to Mecca, which, that, which is in the Quran, and instituting the Ramadan fast as a replacement of the older fasting practice, both of these things are reasserting an Abrahamic Arab heritage for the community and constructing a new religious identity. So this is, again, this is, very, this is a very, very key point. Um, and we can go further on this, right? So there's actually a number of parallels between fasting in the month of Ramadan and the uh, Jewish day of atonement, right? The Jewish practice of atonement, which culminates on Yom Kippur, but actually begins before that. So here's what they are. So according to the Ramadan fasting guidance, which is in this verse of the Quran, 2.185, uh, this fast would be for 30 days. This directly parallels the fact that according to both the Quran and Jewish tradition, Moses spent 30 nights plus an additional 10 nights at Mount Sinai, right? Moses was up, he went up to Mount Sinai for 40 nights in total. Uh, and then when Moses came back from that sort of 40 night uh, excursion, spiritual retreat at Mount Sinai, that's when he brings the tablets of the Ten Commandments to the Israelites. So Jews, some Jews, not all, but devout Jews would actually fast for 40 days up to Yom Kippur. That was the Jewish fasting practice. And now all of a sudden you have a new Muslim fasting practice of 30 days of Ramadan, which has basically been constructed uh, almost as a parallel or a mirror of the Jewish fasting practice. So that just goes to show you the context of why this is there. Uh, we are told in the Quran, and this it's in the verse that you see here, the month of Ramadan in which the Quran was sent down as a guidance to the people. So the Quran is, quote, sent down in Ramadan. Similarly, Yom Kippur is the day when Moses came down from Sinai with the tablets of the commandments. So in one sense, the fasting of Ramadan is a thanksgiving fast, right? It's a, it's a way of showing one's thanks to God for divine guidance. This is also significant because in pre-Islamic Arabian culture, fasting was a penance. It was a, a, a sort of fasting has a, a sadness associated with it in the pre-Islamic Arabian culture. But what the Quran is doing here is it's repurposing fasting, where now fasting is not about making up for sins, or broken promises. Fasting is, is, a, is an expression of thanksgiving. So it changes uh, the meaning of fasting, the Quran does. Now you have these hadiths, which I already mentioned, right? Ramadan is a month in which the gates of heaven are opened and the gates of hell are closed. 
according to the Hadith. Well, uh, the Yom Kippur prayer talks is a prayer to God, asking God to open the gate, right? Open the gate to heaven. According to the Jewish rabbinical sources uh, on Yom Kippur, uh, the, gate of, the gates of heaven are open and God is listening to prayers. So again, uh, what, we, what we see here is direct parallels between Ramadan fasting and the significance of Ramadan and the Jewish uh, Day of Atonement known as Yom Kippur. Like you can see from the material that I've shown on the slide here that the parallels uh, are very, very clear. And this all goes to show that even the practices, the religious practices that we find in the Quran, in the Quran, uh, those practices are very much context dependent, right? They are they are uh, they are context dependent, and that what that's telling us is that it's not like these practices have sort of they've been written down, you know, in eternity and simply communicated to us. These practices are constructed uh, on the spot in response to what is going on in, in the real world. That's, that's the main message from here, right? So that's, that's what, I, what I would you know, ask people to pay attention to. And, and one can go deeper on it. So those, these are the, we, you know, if you look at the verses here, 2183, 2184, 2185. Uh, if you keep reading, you find more verses about fasting. So let's do that. So here, 2186, where God apparently says, when my servants question you, Muhammad, concerning me, then I am near. I answer the call of the caller when he supplicates. So that's very interesting, right? God is basically saying, I'm right. I'm very close to those who are praying to me. Well, what do we find in the Jewish rabbinical sources? We find something very, very similar. Uh, again, this is associated with the Jewish uh, Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. Um, we also find the same thing in the Hebrew Bible, this idea of God is near, you can call upon God. Now, initially, the rules of Ramadan fasting said that sexual relations with your spouse were not allowed at night. Initially, so the original rule was for the entire month of Ramadan, you cannot have any sexual relations with your spouse, even, even, during, even after sundown. The initial rule of Ramadan fasting also required that if a person is fasting during the day and they fall asleep and then they wake up at night, they can't eat. They have to keep fasting all the way until the next sunset. And we know this because this is how sort of ancient Jews and Christians fasted, right? So the ancient Jewish and Christian fasting practice was that if you're fasting during the day and you fall asleep and then you wake up later on and it's already nighttime, you're not allowed to break your fast. You have to actually fast all the way till, you know, through the next day into the next night. So imagine that, like imagine how difficult uh, that type of fasting is. And there's evidence that the fasting that was ordered in the Quran in the previous verse, 2185, that was the type of fasting that was ordered. And we find actually then uh, another verse was revealed. And so 2187, and look what 2187 says. It says here, permitted to you upon the night of the fast is to go into your wives. They are vestment for you and you are vestment for them. God knows that you have been betraying yourselves and has turned to you and pardoned you. So let's just pause there. What, what is going on here? Uh, the verse is basically saying, okay, you are, you're now allowed to have sexual relations during the nights of the month of fasting. And it, it says here, God knows that you've been betraying yourselves. The language here basically indicates that uh, members of the prophet's community were not able to keep to the original fasting rules. So apparently uh, members in that community 
were unable to keep to the rules. So they were having sexual relations at night when it was not allowed. The, the verse goes on to say, eat and drink until the white thread shows clearly to you from the black thread at dawn, then complete the fast unto the night. So this is basically saying that uh, you are allowed to eat if the sun is down. You're allowed to eat until dawn. And that part of the verse is modifying the rule where if you fell asleep and you woke up at night, you're not allowed to eat. So what's happening here, and this is what scholars on the topic have written, uh, they say, George Vajda, for example, says, that carnal relations were forbidden during the nights of fasting. And if after the prayer of Atama, the sunset prayer, a man fell asleep, he should not eat again if he awoke during the night. But in as much in the aftermath of certain incidents, for example, a Muslim deprived of nourishment for more than hours fell ill on the second day, Omar and others disobeyed the prohibition of sexual relations. So basically people in the community, in Prophet Muhammad's community, they couldn't even do the original fasting. It was too hard. One person got sick. Other people still had sexual relations at night. They were just unable to keep to this very strict fasting regime. So what does the Quran do? What do God and Muhammad do? Do they say to them, too bad, you're going to hell? No. The Quran comes and changes the fasting rule. The Quran actually makes the fasting rules easier than they originally were. All of this happens within a span of you know two or three years. So within two or three years, the prayer direction changes. The fasting practice changes from Yom Kippur to a new thing called Ramadan fasting. And then even the Ramadan fasting uh, changes. It's modified. So God and Prophet Muhammad have modified uh, prayer and fasting rituals about three or four times within three or four years. All of this is happening during the period in which the Quran is being revealed. So what does this tell us? I mean, think about the implications of this, right? What does this tell us about the nature of religious practices? Are religious practices supposed to remain unchanged for eternity just because the Quran says it? Because what we are seeing here is that the Quran itself seems to be modifying religious practices in response to the political situation, the religious identity of the community, as well as the community's own ability to keep to those religious practices. So George Vajda again concludes that we can, con you know, we can say from these available materials and evidence that the, susp the suspension of the fast and of the restrictions that it imposed, recognized by the Quran as lasting all night, constituted an innovation and an alleviation with respect to the fasting rules followed by Jews and Christians. Second, the fasting, the severe fasting regime that the Quran abolishes must necessarily coincide with the period when the five canonical prayers were not yet known. As a result, the atama identified in the text as the limit for the breaking of the fast is the third prayer, the evening prayer. Uh, so, so again, um, the Quran is abolishing prior fasting rituals it's instituting new fasting rituals that's the ramadan fast over the yom kippur fast yet the the new fasting that the quran introduces the ramadan fast is clearly built in the image of the jewish fasting practices and then at the same time the quran eases and abolishes the strictness uh, of the jewish and christian fasting for a much more easier form of fasting um, just responding to what somebody's saying in the chat, someone is trying to join and needs an ID. So they can also do do this on, on YouTube uh, live if they want, right? So they can see it that way. So let's sort of take a step back, right? We just looked at the practice of fasting. But what I want to point out from, from just the fasting example, and we know this more generally, is the Quran during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, it did not behave as a book it behaved as an evolving form of oral guidance, right? Oral guidance. So the Quran was not written as a book. 
uh, it was constantly shifting and changing in terms of its guidance. And, and the guidance was shifting in response to what is going on in history. So you can better imagine the Quran as something like this, right? Uh, we have Muhammad's 23-year mission. There are various situations that the prophet encounters. And when different situations come up, the prophet would give divine guidance in response to those situations. Some of that guidance would be in the form of Quranic verses, and some of that guidance would be in Prophet Muhammad's own words. But the point is, is that you have a, what I call, dynamic divine guidance model toward law and ritual practice. So the rituals are changing. The rituals are shifting during the 23 years of Prophet Muhammad's mission. One scholar, uh, George Hurani, has written uh, on, on this particular topic that the Quran and Muhammad display a common sense attitude and we should not expect either of them to claim that for every ethical judgment he, he makes, a man must consult a book or a scholar or work out an analogy when the book or scholar give no direct answers. So according to George Hurani, it wasn't, you know, the prophet Muhammad did not bring us this fixed body of law where the answer to every question was already determined. And you just simply have to sort of read the book and find the answer. That is not what happened. Rather, what actually happened is that Prophet Muhammad would give evolving and updating divine guidance to his community as and when uh, different matters were brought to him. Right. This is a, again, this is a very different model than what will actually develop uh, for many Muslims after uh, Prophet Muhammad. And the reason why the Quran calls itself a kitab, which is often mistranslated as book, but the reason why the Quran calls itself kitab, it's not because the physical form of the Quran is, is a book or so, is supposed to be a book. Uh, rather, uh, the reason is because kitab also means divine decree or divine prescription. And it's this idea that this guidance that you find in the Quran is ultimately coming from God. That is what the word kitab indicates. So kitab is more so about the, the origin of the Quran as divine guidance. It's not really about the uh, physical form. Of the Quran, because in the initial period, all these Quranic verses, which I'm calling Qurans, that these are all, these are all oral. These are not written down. Uh, they will get written down at a later point in time. So, about 20 years after the death of Prophet Muhammad, the different verses they are grouped into surahs. We don't know who grouped them into surahs. It's possible that the Prophet grouped them into surahs, or later people did. We don't know. But in either case. Uh, the different recitations, these oral recitations, are committed to writing, and then all the different written forms are brought together as a book, as a scripture. But the Prophet Muhammad doesn't do this, right? The Prophet Muhammad did not leave behind a Quranic book. Uh, the Caliph Uthman was responsible for this. And there's actually nothing in the Quran itself that says this should become a book, the Quran, when it's being revealed through Prophet Muhammad to his community, it never claims to be a book. Nowhere, nowhere does the Quran claim to be a physical book. And we know this because many uh, unbelievers, Jews and Christians, did not believe in the Quran because it was not a physical book. And they were demanding it to be a physical book, but it was not a physical book. So this is a very important point. And the reason why is because when something is written in book form, right, when divine guidance is put into the form of a book, it gives us the illusion that the guidance is eternally binding, right? That the guidance must be followed for all times because it exists as a book and 
when you put something in writing, it has this sense of permanency. So because the Quran today has be, you know, it exists in the form of a book, we have this impression that all the guidance in the Quran must be followed uh, literally forever. And what I'm saying is that this is really not the case because the Quran in its own uh, revelation doesn't behave that way. The Quran in its own revelation behaves as a set of evolving divine guidance, right? You could call uh, it's, it's, it's self updating divine guidance. It doesn't behave like the totality of divine guidance that everybody um, needs forever. So, so this is uh, this is an important point. Now, what will happen after the prophet dies, and you know, within the first two three hundred years, is many Muslims will adopt a law based approach, a law based hermeneutic towards Islam and towards interpreting the Quran. And what that means is that. Many people will read the Quran looking to categorize every practice and every action into obligatory, recommended, neutral, reprehensible, or forbidden. Because, you know, the Quran doesn't clearly tell you uh, what category each practice or action um, belongs to. It doesn't say that. Uh, it doesn't say fasting in Ramadan is mandatory. It does say, you know, let those of you who are present fast. It says that, but it doesn't say fasting is mandatory. It is actually the interpretation of the legal scholars within the first 200 years that categorizes fasting in Ramadan as mandatory, what we call fard or wajib. And it's part of that legal discourse that fasting in Ramadan is categorized as one of the five pillars of Islam, right? The Quran does not talk about five pillars of Islam at all. It, it doesn't talk about that. Uh, it doesn't talk about any pillars of Islam. The, the uh, Quran talks about, for example, I don't know if we lost the screen there. The, the Quran talks about many sort of duties there are many imperative statements in the quran like do this and do that uh, but those are not limited to five pillars or any pillars so the idea that there are five religious practices that are obligatory is not from the quran it is from the legal scholars right what we call the jurists and it is an interpretation of the quran i'm not saying it's wrong all I'm saying is that it is an interpretation of the Quran to conclude that fasting is a mandatory pillar of Islam or pillar of religion. Uh, to, to make this easier for you, let me give you an analogy. So it, if you want to think about what the Quran is like when it's being revealed, how the Quran behaves originally, you can think about Google Maps. Right. So in, in, when you use Google Maps, the app is giving you guidance on reaching your destination, very much tailored to your context. So, you know, it maps out a route. And then if you go the wrong way, it reroutes you. Right. It, 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 it sort of reconstructs a new route for you. If conditions change, if a road is closed, if the bridge is closed, if there's bad weather or if there's traffic, the app finds you a new route. So Google Maps is a form of responsive guidance, right? Responsive guidance. I would argue that this is how the Quran behaves. That's how the Quran functioned during its own time. It's very much like Google Maps. And, and if you think about it, Google Maps is oral guidance. Google Maps doesn't behave like a book when you're using uh, the app. Now, this changes for many Muslims, right? Those who are doing the legal interpretation, they're not dealing with a Quran that is evolving. They're dealing with the Quran as a book. That's sort of like MapQuest. You guys remember MapQuest? You know, before we had data plans and stuff, you printed out your directions and they're written. And then you go in your car and you use the printed map. And you know, if you turn the wrong way or if you are facing the wrong way or you get lost, you have to interpret the MapQuest map, 
to find out where to go. It doesn't automatically redirect you. It doesn't update. It doesn't uh, give you live guidance. You have to interpret the written map. So now the Quran as a book after the death of Prophet Muhammad functions more like MapQuest. And Muslim scholars, the Sunnis come up with this first. They, they come up with a legal methodology, all these different ways of interpreting the Quran as a book. And they use those interpretations and they come up with what you call fiqh, legal rulings. Uh, and these are the topics in this, this graphic here. These are like the topics that Muslim fiqh, legal rulings, deals with. And fiqh here uh, is a human interpretation, right? This is all human interpretation. So all the rules of prayer and fasting that you see, you know, pilgrimage, all the ritual practices as understood today, right? And, and even in the past, but all the ways that Muslims understand how to practice Islam, it, it all belongs to fiqh because the Quran does not even provide details on prayer, fasting, pilgrimage. Like compare what the Quran says about fasting very little, but compare what the Quran says about fasting to what a fiqh text says about fasting. The fiqh text says like 10 times more than what the Quran says about fasting. Uh, and the reason is because the actual practice of fasting as done by Muslim communities, and it's not just fasting, it goes for everything, is the product of fiqh, of human interpretation, for example. Right, so that's, uh, that's, that's important to note. Now, what is the Ismaili approach to this issue? So what's the, what, what is the uh, Ismaili approach to this question of interpretation of the Quran and divine guidance after the Quran, right? This is, this is an important point. So let's begin with sort of how do, for the most part, Sunnis and Ithnashri Shias, how do they understand the revelation of the Quran? We have to begin with that. How is the Quran revealed? The Quran itself uh, talks about how it's revealed, but it does so in a vocabulary uh, that later Muslims didn't exactly use. So within about two, three hundred years, uh, Muslims are talking about the revelation of the Quran, but they're doing it in different vocabulary. So here's the general understanding among majority of Muslims. This is what the majority of Muslims believe. So first there's this idea that God speaks. So there's either an attribute of God or an act of God. However, there's a disagreement about that. But there's this idea that there is a reality called God's speech. And whether it is a created action of God or whether it is an uncreated attribute of God. Again, Muslims debate this, but regardless of that, there is this belief among Sunnis and 12 or Shia that God's speech contains commands, prohibitions, and information. So a set of things, a set of eternal things that uh, God wants people to perform, commands, a set of eternal things that God wants people not to do, and a set of eternal truths that God wants people to know. So command, prohibition, information. And what happens is that God's speech, a subset of these, right? So not all of them, but some commands, some prohibitions, and some information is expressed in Arabic. Uh, the details of that vary on how it becomes Arabic, but the point is that it, it comes into the form of Arabic, and that is given to the angel Gabriel. Again, this is the Sunni 12-er view. Then the angel Gabriel, over 23 years, he came down to Prophet Muhammad numerous times, and he dictated the Arabic form of God's commands, prohibitions, and information to the Prophet. And the belief here is that the Prophet heard uh, this Arabic divine guidance, literally, he heard it in Arabic. And then what happens is some of that the Prophet Muhammad recites in its original form. So some of the, the Arabic divine guidance that Gabriel gives to the Prophet is in the form of a recitation. So the Prophet has to recite that word for word without changing it, and that's called the Quran. Uh, 
but some of the guidance that Gabriel brings from God to the prophet, some of that does not have to be recited. It has to just be communicated. So the prophet will communicate that in his own words, right? And that is what you call the communication in the form of meaning or the gist. And this is what uh, Twelvers and Sunnis called the Sunnah. So the prophet recites Quran, which is, you could say that's the verbatim speech of God, but he also conveys God's speech in the form of his own words, and that's called Sunnah. Now, this is what, generally speaking, this is what the Twelver Shia and the Sunnis, generally speaking, this is what they believe. Now, it doesn't end there because, you know, Prophet Muhammad passes away and now you're left with the Quran and then you're left with the Sunnah. And there's a huge debate over where you can find the Sunnah. I'm not going to get into it, but there's no one answer on where you find the Sunnah. But for most people, the Hadith is where you find the Sunnah. But what has to happen is that the Quran and the Hadith, they have to be interpreted. So who's supposed to interpret them? Ultimately, it's the legal scholars, because for the Twelve or Shia, the Imam is in hiding, the Twelfth Imam is in hiding. So the Sunni legal scholars and the Twelve or legal scholars, they interpret the Quran and the Sunnah, but they have to have methods to interpret it. So Qiyas is analogical reasoning. Ijma is consensus. Uh, maslaha is, you know, well-being. So there are different principles of interpretation, and they interpret these texts. What they're trying to do is they're trying to understand at the end of the day that they're, they're making, uh, you could say they're making educated guesses, educated interpretations. They're attempting to get ultimately at God's commands, prohibitions, and information, including the ones that are not in the Quran and the Sunnah, right? There's so many issues that are not even mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, but there's a belief that God must have a ruling about those. So what you have for Sunnis and Twelvers is that God is the legislature, the, le the legislator of Sharia, right? God's guidance, go command, prohibition, information, and that the content of this Sharia consists of rulings. So rulings such as X, Y, Z are mandatory, A, B, C are prohibited, uh, you know, D, E, F are information that you need to know, so those are what you call rulings, a hukum or ahkam. And the belief is that these rulings that make up the sharia, they exist in God's speech or God's will eternally. So they're always known to God, but they're not known to us. So fiqh is a method or methods of interpretation whereby a fallible scholar, someone who could be wrong, is going to attempt to understand the sharia, right? The attempt to understand God's rulings, God's rules, God's guidance through the available resources. So the outcome of that is called fiqh. And that's why you have different le uh, Sunni legal schools of fiqh. So according to fiqh, Ramadan fasting is mandatory and it's one of the five pillars of Islam. Again, this is according to fiqh. Now, what's the Ismaili take on this? Well, what we're going to find is the Ismaili view is quite different. So this is a quote from the 14th Imam, uh, Imam al-Muiz. You are all familiar with him. And this is in a text from the Fatimid period called the Tawil al-Sharia, the inner meaning, which means the inner meaning of the Sharia. Now, read carefully what Imam al-Muiz says about how the Quran is revealed. And, and for ease, I'm going to put the model on the screen uh, which is basically translating what the Imam has said in a visual form. But what the Imam says here is that God sent down the light, which he mentioned in the Quran upon the heart of Muhammad. So what God gives to Muhammad is not Arabic, it's light. The prophet could not send down that divine lordly light upon the hearts of the believers because they lack the capacity to bear it. So God inspires Muhammad with nur, with light. The prophet experiences this light in his heart. Uh, it's not a material light. It's a spiritual light. And the prophet, however, cannot communicate that light directly to everybody else because they don't have a pure heart to receive that light. 
So according to this, what the prophet does, as the quote continues, says he only conveyed the meanings of the inspiration and the light, its obligations, rulings, and illusions by means of composed expressions and arranged combined and audible letters. When the prophet composed these expressions and these letters and enclosed in them the meanings that the inspiration contained, the Quran, the recitation, constructed according to the light, which is the revealed inspiration, became the speech of the messenger. So what this is saying is that God sends a light, a spiritual light, to Prophet Muhammad's heart. And I don't know, maybe my, my camera's in the way, but there's the whole quote. So the light comes to the heart of Muhammad. And it's not word, it's not Arabic, it's, it's spiritual. And then what the prophet does is the prophet experiences that light and he comes up with Arabic words to communicate the knowledge within that light, within that divine inspiration to his community. So the prophet is actually the one who comes up with the words of the Quran. The composer of the actual Quran in Arabic is not God, it's the prophet Muhammad. And that's why the imam says the Quran, the recitation constructed according to the light, is the speech of the messenger. And so this quote concludes by saying that the Quran is the speech of God and the word of the messenger of God. So God's speech in this Ismaili view is not an Arabic. It's spiritual. It's completely spiritual. It's immaterial. And the prophet experiences God's speech directly in the form of light. And then the prophet translates that into Arabic. Some of it he translates as the Quran and some of it he translates as prophetic guidance. But in either case, uh, the, the, the lesson here is that according to Ismaili teachings, which I've studied in my own dissertation, so I've looked at multiple Ismaili authors, but according to Ismaili teachings, uh, as historically articulated here, the, uh, the words of the Quran in terms of being Arabic are actually the divinely inspired words of Prophet Muhammad. And what happens afterwards is that that same light that was initially revealed to the Prophet Muhammad as divine inspiration, that continues, that light continues in the Imams. And therefore the Imams uh, will continue to give updated divine guidance. So in this view, the uh, Prophet Muhammad is the legislator of the Sharia. And the Prophet Muhammad constructed the Sharia in response to his own time and his own circumstances. So this is where you have this idea that, um, that fasting, right? That fasting in Ramadan was actually the outcome of an evolution in religious practice that the Prophet Muhammad instituted in response to the religious context that was going on at the time, right? The relationship with the Jews. So what I explained previously, how first they faced Mecca in prayer when they're in Mecca, and then they change the prayer direction to Jerusalem, right? The prophet changes to Jerusalem. Then the prophet says, oh, you guys are fasting on Yom Kippur. Great. We'll fast on Yom Kippur. And then later when relations with the Jewish communities are not good, the Qibla changes to Mecca. And now the Yom Kippur fasting is abolished. It's replaced by Ramadan fasting. But then even the Ramadan fasting itself is further modified to make it easier. So in the Ismaili interpretation, none of that would be a surprise. It's, that's exactly what, what you'd expect, because what's happening is that all those Quranic verses have been composed by the Prophet Muhammad, right? By divine inspiration, the Prophet Muhammad, he chose those verses. He came up with the content of the religious practices and he's the one who's changing them. As things on the ground change, the Prophet Muhammad is changing the religious practices. And in that context, the role of the Imam in the Ismaili tradition is to continue evolving religious practices. That's what the Imam is supposed to do. The Imam is guided by the same light. The only difference is the Imam does not express the light 
in the form of Quran. He expresses this, that guiding light in the form of general guidance, what we call ta'lim and ta'wil. But otherwise, the imam has the full authority to continue giving updated divine guidance tailored to changing times, just as Prophet Muhammad, in the form of the Quran and the form of his own guidance, was giving uh, divine guidance and legislating religious practice uh, in response to the circumstances of his time. So that's that's basically what the Ismaili model uh, would would say in terms of framing these issues.